Hi, everybody. Welcome to Davos. Uh, we are here at Greek House for a very, very special panel uh, to talk about healthcare technologies, how the world is impacted, what we think will happen, what we know is going to happen, and how we can play a vital role in changing outcomes and improving lives. So before we start the panel, I'd like us to uh, speak to the panelists and learn a little bit about who they are and what they do. So to my left, Bear. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my friends call me Bear. My actual name is Lyle Maxson. Uh, I am the founder of a few tech companies all around healthcare. Um, the one that I imagine I'll be speaking about more today is called SoundSelf. It's a digital therapeutic. Um, the best way to describe it is essentially a video game treatment for mental health. It is undergoing a variety of clinical trials right now to actually get FDA approval, um, but currently it is a over-the-counter experience for anxiety and depression. Um, mainly, the experience is driven by the voice, so it's vocal feedback that creates visuals, audio, and a vibration through your body that uh, drops you into a very deep parasympathetic state, um, which is shown to reduce anxiety and depression significantly. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Bear. Barbara. Hello, everybody. I'm Barbara Geladakis. I'm a medical doctor, and I'm the founder and CEO of Rodi Fertility. In Rodi Fertility, we have been uh, focused in the past years in the scientific research on how to uh, combat the implantation failures and miscarriages, which is a, hu a huge uni universal uh, problem that doesn't have uh, without geographical bound boundaries, and it concerns women and couples uh, worldwide. And it is a completely unmet need uh, currently. There are, there, there are no treatments for uh, most of the cases of miscarriages. And we are focused in the immune-mediated miscarriages, uh, basically when uh, the human body, of, uh, the, the body of the woman, uh, sees uh, the baby as foreign, because in reality half of the genetic material comes from the man and it's half foreign and normally should reject it. And we have found, uh, we have invented and patented a technology, a solution that um, um, regulates the immune system and creates an immunomodulation in order to protect the body from uh, attacking and rejecting the baby. And uh, we started as an R&D company, and now we are uh, into commercialization. Thank you, Barbara. All right. Joost. My name is Joost Fischer. Uh, I have been uh, through a career of management, uh, running companies, CEO, until I was able to take over Serona, the dental company, uh, uh, where we had a technology uh, called CEREC, uh, that was like second to none. Nobody was able to do that. Uh, uh, we started already in, in 2001. We bought it actually from the University of Zurich, the patent, and then we moved it uh, uh, to commercialization. And you know what universities cannot do? We did. Uh, we had like uh, almost 200 engineers and scientists to, to advance that and moved to software, which was it started out as hardware thing and moved to software even more. And uh, that was my claim to fame. Uh, uh, and I, I ran the company for 11 years, uh, three times leverage buyout. That was, you learned the financials by then, as we talked about this earlier. And then we listed at NASDAQ. Uh, and that was a, a, a nice uh, a run up from a 200 million uh, euro company to a 6.2 billion company when, when I left. Uh, after that, I'm an investor in, in healthcare in a number of businesses, not only healthcare, but also technology, software, that's where we meet uh, uh, in here, like, uh, like a big app that's gonna be launched soon called Orion. Uh, uh, it, there's other things uh, that we do is, you know, the Botox uh, side of it. We have a competition to Botox, which we believe lasts longer, is a little bit better. We floated the company on the market, pretty successful. And we have another company that we just uh, made an IPO on uh, in uh, August. Uh, zero sales, <laughs> a bit FDA approval pending, you know, that's a lot of expensive stuff, and I think too expensive at this point in time. FDA approvals in the U.S. Uh, take many years, uh, and uh, every 
side that you want to do with one product is like a sixty seventy million dollar uh, uh, a cost ticket and I think that's uh, uh, we can discuss this later. I think there are opportunities to do better. Thank so it's, in, it's interesting. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, and the last group is really smart, so I knew this answer. The Olympics, where did it begin? Greece. Um, the early days of identifying illnesses and how to treat them was in Greece. Hippocrates is being one of the most famous that we know. So talking about technology, and why is it so expensive, Yost? Um, why are governments um, creating so much friction that, in, that hurts the ability to help the youth or to help moms? It's a human nature. Like, if you are an entrepreneur, you put in your own money, you lose it, okay, you're done, okay? Or you try again, whatever. In politics, you don't spend your own money, you spend other people's money. A and B, uh, uh, you have constituents, which is uh, 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 the people of your country or of uh, the way where you are, and they come and demand things from you. You should do this, you should do that. And at the end of the day, you have to take responsibility. And making decisions is one thing, taking responsibility is another thing. So now, if you come and approve a drug, like uh, you, you see these obesity drugs that come out uh, very good, very well, cost a lot of money. But if you approve something like that and it fails, the politicians, the guys that make the decisions are responsible. And what do they do? They like to delegate. Oh, we should do this first, and then we should do another thing, and then we need another 100 people to test so that we absolutely save nothing happens. And that's how it drags on. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm saying at the moment it's overdone. And I'll give you an example. We have a drug and I call it Botox because Botox is our competitor, but it has 80% 80, 80, uh, market share, so it's easier for you to remember. So we have that, and we brought it to the market. Stock market is fine, it's called Evolus, uh, and this product, absolutely the same. It's cosmetic, right? You know what I mean, wrinkles and stuff. Yeah. More and more for men, by the way. Not only for women. Women start early, with the, in their early 20s, to do use that drug. You need it every 90 days. That's fine, so you get recurring revenue. But now, we have this Botox stuff. It's so much better, and it, it's so much, it gives you so much positive impact on your health for bladder, for... Uh, uh, cervical dystonia uh, for mental brain and you know what we have to go through everything we have four products we have to go through this tiresome process again although a the product is out in the market already for years many years B doctors like uh, if you're a medical doctor you can use that and say it's good for cervical dystonia but we can't label our product for that. So it's used, but we have to spend $280 million to get to the point where we can say, hey, this is our product. We sell it to clinics, you can have it. I think that's uh, uh, just one way how you see uh, these things come, because, hey, if somebody, an acti we call him an activist, says, oh, but if they do this now and something happens and, and, and one out of a million dies or, or has uh, an effect of it, you can't do that. So, and therefore, people want security. Security costs money, costs time, and I'm not sure we all have that. Thank you, Yost. Now, Barbara, how much of this in your world applies? Because it sounds like there are these challenges, these hurdles, these roadblocks to enter markets, where if you could enter, you could extend lives, you could fix families. So talk about your process here as you are doing something to, 
to ultimately change the world, to give mothers the ability to have healthy babies and fathers or partners to not have to feel such a loss. I will tell you that um, currently there is a, a significant problem of uh, uh, infertility problem globally. If you can see the, the rates are declining all over Europe, all over the world. In Europe, in order to sustain the population of Europe, uh, the life birth rate should be 2.1, and currently it's at 1.3. Even China uh, dropped by 10% the life, life uh, birth rate uh, last year, within a year. So um, for us, uh, what we did is um, we've been running uh, the clinical research for many years. Uh, combating a completely unmet need, you know, because miscarriages play a crucial role, a cr a crucial role in infertility. Uh, because, uh, and that is people don't really understand and don't really know how big this market is. Uh, it, according to statistics, at least one in four women will have a miscarriage. And that is until the age of uh, 30. So in the Western world, women are having babies in, later on. So uh, as a woman grows older, the, the, the percentage of the, the rate of miscarriages increases and it can uh, end up to 50%. So imagine here we have a, a, a room of like 100 women that we all want to have a baby, you know, between 25 and 50 women will have a miscarriage. And that is, um, and, and in most of the cases, uh, when they have a miscarriage, the, uh, the, the doctor cannot give them a reason why this happened. And they end up having a, blaming their, themselves without knowing why. And it comes along with uh, a lot of, um, uh, it's a costly process to recover from. Uh, and it comes along with uh, side effects which, which are mental and physical along. I will give you the, the, the let's say also it places a, an important uh, burden in the social uh, healthcare systems. Um, uh, one country that reports miscarriages uh, a lot is the UK where uh, uh, they have approximately 500 miscarriages per day. And the cost is, uh, to the, uh, the NHS has reported that the cost uh, for uh, handling miscarriages is half a billion annually. And on top of that, in order to handle the psychological side, the psychological, uh, to manage the psychological effect that a woman has after a miscarriage, it can reach up to one billion only for the management uh, of miscarriages. Now, if you extrapolate this cost to to, to all over Europe and to the world, you can understand that the numbers are significantly high. And, and the number of women who suffer in miscarriage is in, incredibly very high. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's an unmet need uh, that needs to be um, uh, addressed. And, um, and it sounds like, Joost, I see you got triggered over there. Oh, yeah, sure. stood out. First of all, more babies that come and grow up, we can keep them healthy later in their life. <laughs> I'm involved in, in, in your uh, side of it, in another, not your company, in another business, uh, and th that's why we thought about that. It. It's, it's kind of keeping uh, women healthy. Now, as you know, birth, not the birth rate, is something, but uh, like my assistant, she got her baby with 40 years old. Uh, when, when that was like 30 years ago, it was more or less impossible to get uh, babies at the age of 40, 41. Now, as we all know, your body is not the same with 20 or 25 than he is with 40 or 45. But if you have IVF or egg freezing, which actually we are in, that means you can get your eggs freeze at the age of 25 and then get the baby at the age of 45. And it has the health of a young woman with, with all the biological positives that come with it, right? Absolutely right, yes, yes. So now it's, a, it's really a trend and, uh, uh, and the doctors um, suggest to young ladies to freeze 
freeze their eggs because you, they never know when they're going to have a baby. Yep. However, it still comes that the, mis the problem of miscarriages exists in young women with young eggs and in all ages. Of course, as the age increases, miscarriages are ha mo more, oh, yeah. but, but even if they, if miscarriages affect even young women. And uh, I, I, I saw the speech of the um, Prime Minister of Denmark, um, her New Year speech, which lasted 15 minutes, and, and, and just for the 10% ten, ten of her speak, she was referring to infertility. And uh, she, she said that like in, in Denmark, 12.5% of, of babies born are through IVF. And there is technology that you need in order to make sure uh, this works out because it has to be over years, right? So now I gotta jump in here. I don't know how many parents are in the room, uh, but I have a 13-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter. My 13-year-old son, he's a gamer. Now what's happening to their minds right now, Bear, <laughs> as they're in this world of gaming? And I can tell you for the most part, while well, it was there before COVID, COVID did make it worse. It was how they connected with their friends. It's how they stayed engaged. And now we're asking them to simply stop using their phone when we as adults can't stop looking at ours. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there is a big uh, focus on community when it comes to the gaming population. You mentioned Roblox. There's, uh, I think the latest number was 50 million daily users inside of Roblox, which I think far surpasses just about any app in the world. Um, yeah, so people lean on that side of the community, but of course there is things that come up with anxiety and depression um, through, you know, lack of sunlight, poor hygiene, poor, you know, nutrition, all that kind of stems from uh, being addicted to these, these, these things. Um, and I particularly work uh, deeply in virtual reality, which is about 70% more addictive than traditional video games that you would find on, on your phone or on desktop uh, because of the level of immersion and your body now being the controller. Um, a lot of people don't think of VR. Um, you know, we think about VR as a screen being strapped to your face, but it's much more because of the embodiment side of it. You're no longer using your fingers and your thumbs as the, as the driving force. It's actually a full body experience, um, which just adds another layer to the addictive qualities. So Yost and I have a mutual friend, Robert Grant, whose company is working on a interocular lens. So I want you to go in there how we can use these technologies in healthcare and also your thought towards bear. Oh yeah, it, it will come, no doubt about it, where you combine your natural ability that I have with my two eyes with a virtual eye, with a little screen on it, where you can watch TV, engage with, with third parties at the same time. You don't need a TV anymore. You don't need a watch anymore or a cell phone anymore. It, that's going to come. The question is how it, it's going to be like seven, eight years, but how will it be applied? And I think there is still uh, 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 some ground to cover to get there. And that goes together with his virtual reality uh, time. It's going to get better and better. And, and here, if I, if I may move a little bit when we talk about healthcare uh, into what we call AI, Künstliche Intelligenz, will make a bigger change than environmental 1.5 degree growth or not going forward. And you all, if, if you're not familiar with, with the space, this is growing so fast. I, I'll give you an, an example. Uh, my godchild, she is a pharmacist and she works in farmers, and then, of, hey, she, she asked a question to the chatbot. Uh, can you give me this and that? The chatbot comes with an answer, mathematical answer. Then she looks it up and says it's 80% right and 20% wrong. So what does she do? She tells them, oh, but you are wrong on this side of it. The chatbot says, yeah, but th this is what I find, thank you, and I'll make it right. So the next time, he was 95% right, from 80 to 95. And then she reports back, and millions of people do that. And they learn stuff that, that mankind had 
2,000 years to learn in three months. So now, translating that into healthcare would mean, first of all, analysis. The easiest one for a AI. I was in dental and we had all these images that you take and you, then you look at it. And once you look at it, you have to be a specialist to understand what it really is. And then we came with three-dimensional things. You could scroll through your teeth and, and see much better what it is. That was technology and then you needed the software to be able to I mean, you really uh, do this. And now AI does the analysis and gives you the answer. You don't need a doctor anymore. Today, yes, uh, because you have the 90% uh, uh, ratio and 10% uh, you need some human brain uh, to take a look at it. That's going to vanish. We will have analysis. We have analysis uh, with AI. And it's going to be much better, much faster, and much more accurate. That's going to happen. And we are not talking, we're not far away. If you would push this end of next year. I'll, I'll give you one better. Not only is, is the AI collecting all of this, this data and analyzing it, but when we think about generative, uh, generative AI, things like mid-journey and the ability to make yeah, videos yeah. And, and images. So, so now in healthcare, one of the things that we're developing on the back end is this voice analysis AI, which not only is able to take all of the data and information from somebody emotionally or physiologically just by your voice signature, but then it could adapt and generate a new experience that's specifically designed for you and what you need in the moment. Self-learning. So, and, and, and more intelligent than you ever could imagine because of that. Mm -hmm. More information and then becomes human. And here is another thing. We go from analysis into treatment. I'm not sure you heard of intuitive surgeon, surgical. That's, that's a robot, robot that makes uh, um, operations with human assistance is it, you know it's a difference human assistance not humans operate and you have a computer to assist but computer operates human assists and they do that for the main reason as i said before is liability <laughs> so yeah. okay we over here there is a human being uh, that is educated to do all this so we have this since 15 years. Now with AI, that is going to go into treatment. So jumping into that, Yost, with Barbara, and I like the treatment side, how are you seeing AI affect the, the industry you're in or the sector of healthcare, specifically fertility? I will tell you that uh, in this discussion, I would like to add that a uh, AI in fertility could support uh, in, in terms of... Uh, um, of the, of the part where it comes to the surgical part, to the intervention part, or when collecting eggs, we can, we can have a better view of the eggs uh, in the future, uh, how, how, uh, whether they're healthy or not, and in terms of the intervention part. However, I think that in, if we, we want to have an integrated uh, healthcare, what is missing is the first step, which is the prevention, information, Oh, yeah. education you know of the people of what is the problem and prevention and that is what we have been focusing on it's preventive medicine in order to support the the job of the doctor afterwards and uh, the, uh, and the intervention uh, processes so uh, prevention is a basic part that is currently missing at least in the infertility space and uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, uh, not even in the pipelines of the pharmaceutical companies, there doesn't exist any preventive uh, uh, treatments or products that they want to produce in the future to combat infertility, and specifically as well, that which is my space, miscarriages. So that will continue to be a problem. And then what is the solution to a woman, which is until now, okay, you will uh, get 
we will help you with the technology, with AI and everything to get pregnant, but then you will have a miscarriage. And then what will be the response? Please try again next time and try again next time. And hopefully you will not have again a miscarriage. But that sounds to be the definition of insanity, that this advice that we're giving seems to just, there has to be a better way. What's the literacy well, needed in this space? Well, uh, what we have been focused on scientific research uh, in Roddy Fertility is to find the solution in order to prevent miscarriages, to, to, to support uh, the, uh, the body of the woman, uh, to accept, um, uh, to, to, to have a successful implantation and uh, continue uh, a healthy pregnancy until the end. In the middle of this process, it comes the doctor, it comes the intervention, it comes the IVF, Possibly, if not, it's a, it's not a conception with uh, a normal on a normal way. However, we have made we have at least increased the chances of uh, of of a woman to have a successful pregnancy and a success and to and, and, and a live birth to maintain this pregnancy. And on top of that, with AI applied, the doctor has a a different job and B can serve. 10 times as many patients as you can do today. Number two, number three, uh, we don't have enough doctors in this world when you look at uh, some countries. And this will So help. if I can ask you real quick about that, Joost. At some point, do we need to change the requirements? Because if we're seeing that it's going down and we don't want to rely on artificial intelligence or some sort of remote, then what do we do? Yep. Here, here, is, here is a simple fact. From dentistry, I know the facts. The facts were we have a declining number of dentists in the U.S., uh, also in, in Europe, in most of Europe. The reason is more retirements than uh, uh, add-ons. And then, okay, this change state sometimes says, okay, we'll put on a new university for dentistry, but you know, it's 10 years. I'm uh, like the chairman of one of these universities, and they are really moon. It's, it's more people they can take. And we invest a lot every time in order uh, to get more uh, uh, site. But here is, here is the point. M now, a majority of uh, applicants are women. But the fact is, women work less hours than men. And you can argue about that, but it's a fact. And you, I met a lot of uh, uh, medical doctors and women, uh, and not like you, but they are having a life. And they said, I'm, I'm having so much fun with dentistry. But you know, I have children, I have hobbies, other things, and I have a husband. So I rather work three days a week. And then I want to take some vacation because I want to visit my children if they are grown up. So we have less available hours for treatment because of this trend. So now you need technology in order to be able to have one doctor be more efficient. I think that's one of those things. But it will help. It will go forward with the treatment. Like our CEREC system is certainly uh, one of that. Uh, if you know that because you've, you've been around, uh, you make it double the time, single visit. It's all so much better for the patient and for the doctor because he treats more patients. So now I wanted to get back to this point of AI, application of that. Said analysis, yes, will be. It will take over. Treatment, will do more. And it will come. We see the signs. We see some results already. It will be massive in the next five years. But what we don't get is the psychological uh, side of it. So you have like the, we call it the regular uh, medical thing, broken bones, uh, a liver problem. That will be taken care of more and more by AI, but not the psychological thing, because that's not logical what happens. So he is in, in that business, I'm in that business, and uh, I'll, I'll give you one example. Companies called Mind 24-7 uh, is, is a US company, and uh, it, it came out of a point, we own emergency room staffing 
because the, the, the guys uh, uh, don't want to work for a hospital because they, they get taken advantage of 20 hours uh, uh, continuous service. And, and when you have a professional company, you said, here, you have a shift, next shift comes somebody else, and the clinic pays. So now we found out through this that a lot of people that get into the most expensive part of our medical system, which is emergency rooms, emergency care, is being used by people that they shouldn't be there. Right? Now, somebody comes and, and avoid uh, drug addicts, whatever, they will be dropped in the hospital because they can't say no. Because that's that's a and that's right to do so. Now, we invested in, in a facility. Each facility is 250 people. And we have not only medical doctors, we have uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, uh, all of that. For these people, they don't need an emergency treatment, but need an immediate treatment, which is different. And so now, uh, it is. The state, it was even started uh, by Donald Trump. He said, okay, I understand that, and I will be helping with funds. And the insurance companies, because of course, it is gonna get more and more expensive if you have to cover a very expensive uh, a treatment uh, uh, for somebody that doesn't need it. And that's something we are funded by the constituents that understand what we can save them in total. But you have to have prime service. First of all, you have to take everyone that comes in because you don't know if they are in, in, in the state as they are, you can't ask them for a credit card to pay, right? So that's why the state has to, to help us do this because that's something that helps the society. And then you have uh, uh, not only like a, a, a medical guy that looks at you, oh, oh, how bad is it? But you have a psychologist, a psychiatrist to help and the treatments for that. And that's 250 people because it's, we call it mine, 24-7. It's day and night, seven days a week because you don't know when they come. And that's something that will, first of all, the diseases are spreading. It's going to get more and more and more. So let's go into that a little bit on the yeah. cost side. And, and on your side, Barbara, um, in the United States, before I became a really cool media guy and the advisor to Greek House, I was in the world of insurance, uh, specifically employee benefits. So in the United States, healthcare is really, really expensive. And I'd have clients come to me from time to time that wanted to seek um, in vitro uh, because they'd had multiple losses and in order to get, it to get it approved, you had to not just go in and ask your doctor to write a letter, you had to prove you had many losses, many births. Why do we create this system that is depriving people of this ability to have healthy births? Depending on the country, but I would say everywhere in the world, the IVF process is a costly pro uh, process. It costs a lot of thousands of um, dollars or euros. In Europe, an average could be five to 7,000 uh, euros. In the US, it can reach to 20,000 euros. So uh, in some countries, uh, social uh, security system do pay partially, do uh, help partially, and um, they want to make sure that the woman, uh, the couple uh, does have a problem uh, uh, offering this amount of money once or uh, twice uh, uh, in, uh, in their life. Um, however, you know, I mean, uh, if the, the, the basic problem in this case is the, the implantation failure. So you have an IVF, it's failed. You have a second one, it's failed. Then probably there is a problem and, and which is not uh, defined. And uh, then uh, people don't want to go. The, the government doesn't want to pay more, more, more for more times than one, two or three times. And then if it's out of pocket money, then people cannot afford it because it's basically a fortune. That is why I still uh, I, I, I am <laughs> focusing again on prevention. You know, what can we do when we have an IVF to make sure that we go there prepared, 
uh, and increase the chances and, and make sure that, make sure at least try to increase the chances of having a successful uh, result, which means a live birth. So Dr. Barbara, what led you specifically to focus your career on this? Well, I started my, during my specializations, I ended up in the hospital. I did my uh, uh, the part of immunology in a public hospital where it was the only department for recurrent miscarriages in Greece. And there I had the um, chance in my life to have like almost 200 women uh, every week visiting us with, with miscarriages. And they were all coming there without giving a reason why and uh, suffering. So I started my research uh, in that department, which um, ended up, of course, in a solution how to, to, to treat immune-mediated miscarriages, because miscarriages are, can happen for many reasons. Approximately 40% of all miscarriages are due to the uh, immune system, the rejection type, which I mentioned earlier. So it doesn't recognize the baby, it attacks it and rejects it. So we found a way and uh, in, uh, with, uh, most, uh, with natural ingredients, which is proactive, so given to a woman before, uh, when she starts uh, trying her pregnancy, before 40 days, to balance her immune system, not to downregulate it, we don't affect it, we just balance it, keep it balanced, and then she tries to have a baby e either through an IVF or a normal way, uh, which we, when, when, yes, when she wants it, uh, and, uh, and then uh, during the first uh, trimester, uh, uh, which most miscarriage is happening, we support women in order to have her immune system balanced. So uh, when I started this, it, I was still in, during my specialization in my early years, it was back in 2014, and we treated many, many women, and we saw that we had a, a good results. Of course, uh, that took many years since commercialization, which took part, uh, which took place like last year in Greece, and what makes me feel um, content and proud and, uh, and really happy is that the doctors have embraced our uh, solutions and they even speak publicly and they just say that they, they have been taking women who had multiple, five, six or seven failed IVFs and with our solutions, they, they managed to get pregnant and have a baby in a natu with natural uh, ingredients that we don't harm the baby. And, and, and when I see this, this these women, these couples with, with, with a baby in their arms, you know, it's the best uh, uh, gift that could ever give you to You get to me, see you know. the outcome. Yes, I get to see Lives the outcome. Change. It's a live baby, it's a birth, and you can see the happiness in these people because they had given up hope. And some of them had uh, also invested a fortune in this process. And even and some couples do want to have babies, but they cannot support it financially in some cases, you know. So they, they, cannot, they have to stop uh, if they cannot have a baby on their own. So offering something which is um, uh, uh, affordable, which is natural, and which is scientifically proven, which can be measurable in, in, with a simple blood test and can increase the chances is, I think, uh, is uh, um, a crucial step um, uh, in reproductive health. Uh, and uh, I, I truly hope in the future years, we are, which we are now commercializing in uh, many countries, to, to be able to support couples and uh, w women and couples uh, worldwide to enjoy this marvel of, uh, marvel of uh, uh, pregnancy, of, of having a baby, of motherhood, actually. So I wish when we were working on healthcare reform in the United States that we would have had you at the table um, to help talk about the impact and what is needed. Uh, there needs to be a mindset change among decision makers. And to those that feel pain, they should be on social media tweeting out. They should be sure. raising their voice. They need to free their voice. Now, we talked about helping uh, yeah, adults. Can, can, can I add, uh, excuse me, uh, I would like to add something, that um, the, um, the management of miscarriages, it's basically, and, and the immune mis mediated miscarriages, which account, as I said, like 37.5, almost 40% of the total, is a new market creation. I mean, it, it, it did not exist until now. So we're basically the first ones to, to, to enter this field. 
and it and it's important you know education and awareness is important that women should know that it's not um, in some cases you know women when they have a miscarriage they blame themselves they don't know and in and in some countries also it's a social stigma they should understand that there are simple ways you know and, and there is uh, uh, that that it's not their fault and they can support their body uh, in order to have a, uh, a baby in, uh, in their life. Thank you, Dr. Barbara. And Yost, a moment ago, you were talking about clinics that adults or, or humans are walking into. Well, what about our avatars? Our, our kids that are playing games, even us adults that are playing games online as well, are there digital clinics to support us? Yeah, yeah, so just before uh, we, we chatted before the panel and I was mentioning that Roblox, which you, you mentioned earlier, actually has a uh, digital pharmacy built into the, the metaverse that they've created. Um, there's a company called Atai, um, that, or sorry, there's, there's a few of them. This one's called Akili. Their product's called Endeavor RX and it's uh, FDA approved for ADHD. So kids literally play this game on either Roblox through their avatar on a platform or on their cell phone and it actually gets them off of their Adderall or their Ritalin. Creates new neurosynapses in the brain they only have to play it a couple times a week. And what's really interesting about these digital medicine treatments is you don't become uh, reliant upon it. That actually allows the neuroplasticity in your brain to build up to the point where you don't have to use the technology any longer to have a long lasting effect. That on top of the fact that there's no contraindications like any other pharmaceutical, it's instantly scalable. Um, so yes, there is a lot of ways that this could be applied to the digital avatar. And you know, there's a, I've, talking about avatars, I always make this joke because, I mean, and people don't realize how big the video game industry is. It is over $400 billion a year. It's bigger than, than music and movies combined uh, globally. Um, and, and when you think about people playing these games, typically their avatar as it grows in their stats with strength and wealth and community, their real world stats actually go the opposite direction. They make more money in the game, they make less money in real life. You know, they get healthier in the game, they get fatter and, and uh, you know, it, it just, it really is this inverse reaction. So the whole thing around these games for good is what we call them, is that your real world avatar is now being upgraded as you play a game, which is a whole different experience to, you know, the stigma that, that video games have now. So as we yeah, have... You, to, add, to add to this, uh, when you say virtual reality and people are living in the virtual reality half of their life or even more. So now think, it's not so far away. Think about what do you need in order to have it in your real world. Like if we talk about ocular lenses, we talk about... <laughs> Uh, hands that are from steel or probably ceramic, much better. And then you come to this point of human being, what is it really all about? And then you find out it's your brain. Everything else can be replaced and sometimes better. Not today, but it will happen. I, I, I think with the virtual reality, you create the stepping stone for the real world. That's going to happen. So as we're down now to our final two minutes, um, I'd like to end uh, with you, uh, Dr. Barbara. At first, Bear, what are you learning today? And I will tell you, that question was not mine. Last year, uh, when I came to Davos, uh, I, I called my executive coach. Everyone, I believe, should have somebody to advise them in life. And I asked him, what would be the question? You should, ask, you should ask somebody. And he said, what are you learning today? So with that, Bear, what are you learning today? Yeah, I mean, I, I've known a lot about postpartum depression, but now talking to you and, and learning about just the, you know, the mass amount of people that are affected by miscarriages and what that could do to their mental health, it's very inspiring to see how we could create digital drugs to support that as well. Um, I would say that's huge. And you, know, you mentioned the FDA earlier, and... Uh, there's a lot of issues with FDA with these digital medicines as well. 
Um, mainly, I mean, there's there's two big ones. One is that software you can imp improve at any time. It's just, you know, you click a button and you could upload a new update to the software. But when you start on the medical route of the FDA, you have to have the exact same product. They treat it just like a pharmaceutical would be. So there's these beautiful companies and experiences that are developing these digital tools that if they start their FDA process, and like you said, it's lengthy, it could be- They go bust. For, for a <laughs> and for a de novo process, it could be up to 10 years. Yes. So imagine software that could be improved you know month over month or week over week that has to stay in the exact same development as it was 10 years prior so these games are coming out that they, they could have literally continued to develop them and build them and implement all the data that they're acquiring from all their customers and all their clinical data but instead they have to have the exact same thing or else they have to start the whole process over again so i, I just love learning about the fda and, and how we could potentially bypass it and have these over-the-counter experiences Dr. Barbara, final words. I would uh, like to say that what I've learned today is that uh, talking with uh, both of my co-speakers that um, it would be interesting to incorporate AI into the fertility space, not uh, as a treatment, but as, as, a, as edu educational and awareness and maybe create a journey, a personal journey for every woman that would show her some steps on how she could have, a, so how, what, what would be helpful for her, maybe what the test and what she could do and educate her on the way towards motherhood through an AI or an uh, avatar or in any, any artificial intelligence technique that could be supportive physically and probably also emotionally. So thank you for this. Um, so I'm going to tell you what I learned. I know each of you will have your own takeaway. Um, but uh, Joost, I've known you for a number of years. You have mentored me and given me lots of sound counsel and business advice. I've learned that entrepreneurs take a lot of risk. And they got to be a little bit on the edge of being a little bit crazy because they have to believe it more than anybody. They need our support. They have done the research. They, have, they know the facts. The facts are one in four births are ending and they don't need to. The facts are children like my son and my daughter and your kids and family members need an outlet too, someone to talk to. And along the way, they need someone like Mr. Fisher uh, to help be there, to spur entrepreneurship and to help dreams come alive with your support. So thank you. Thank you to my friend Dante on the front. Thank you everybody for joining us here at Greek House. Thank you, Irene, wherever you are. And it's time each of you in your own lives for your voice. Thank you again. Oh, we have, we had no you. questions from the audience? Well, we can do audience? questions. I mean, Mr. Yost, all right. Questions, front row, what's your name? Hi, Hi. Hi. my name's Bob. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in the medical field, but I'm very interested in it. And I hear a lot of talk about the challenges we have in, let's say, low tech, meaning the problems we have with doctors. And then I hear here that the number of doctors are going down, but we also hear about very high tech solutions. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on medium tech. So I, I think of examples like we see in China with Good Doctor, where you lose a lot of call centers or remote care, where I think the infrastructure could change and also put a lot of benefits into the system, which we're in the Western world not really seeing, but in some parts of the world we're seeing growing very quickly. Just wondering if you have some thoughts on that. If you have a need for doctors and there is no doctor in, in a remote village, uh, how do you resolve that? You resolve that, uh, as we see, uh, 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 through uh, uh, those kind of solutions. And of course, today, it's a little bit difficult because you have nobody on the other side. Because sometimes a, a doctor needs to touch and feel uh, what it's all about in order to give a correct, uh, a future-oriented diagnosis. But with AI, that's going to change. So when you live in a remote area in China, I've been many times to China, also in the remote areas, that will be a better life for these people. In, in a big city, Zurich, you always have a specialist to help you out with this. Oh, IWF, I'm sure within six months, she's going to have a big thing in Zurich, right? So you go there. But will you go to Heilongjiang or uh, to a third-tier city in, in China within the next five years? I doubt it, right? So this will help. I think that uh, 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 we're going to have a better care with this. Of course, uh, there are challenges, 
when they come to it. How do you apply that? What's the problem here? You think uh, politicians say, oh, but when you look at it ethically, ethically we'll challenge that, we don't want that. But at the end of the day, the better solution will uh, uh, enable you uh, for that and it, it will go forward. Thank you, Joost. Thank you. Uh, and I know, Gabriel, you had your hand up to ask Barbara a question. Uh, so if we can get it to the gentleman here, Gabriel. Uh, yeah, right here. So this gentleman, Gabriel. Question yeah. for Barbara. Um, we have um, a new technology, and uh, as a matter of fact, we're very interested in, in also getting a suggestion. Um, we use quantum dots to interfere, uh, to actually to, to, to um, communicate to the body any kind of molecule. Um, we would like to um, also understand uh, your technology and see if we can integrate uh, the quantum dot technology into what you're doing. I, I think it, it would be very interesting uh, because we have we use a, basically a bracelet on on the person and we can communicate with the body, you know, without you know going through all the old process of um, <clears throat> having to put chemicals in the body. What? <laughs> As I um, thank you. Uh, um, <laughs> well, what we are doing, uh, um, specific ingredients, uh, natural ingredients, can alter immune uh, responses or can down-regulate immune responses. What we want for a successful pregnancy before, for implantation and during, is a balanced immune response, neither aggressive nor uh, down-regulated. So, uh, uh, when, when uh, of giving to the body specific uh, ingredients for a specific time at a specific dose, we balance the immune cells, specific immune cells, which have been accused when they are more in their number in the body, in the blood, uh, in the bl uh, bloodstream, in the peripheral blood, that can cause miscarriages. That's international research. So when feeding these cells with specific ingredients, feeding the body with specific ingredients for a specific time, these cells uh, uh, go back to their normal levels. So basically, our, uh, our, our basic ingredients are natural ingredients, so we don't have uh, chemicals that could affect a woman's body. Neither the doctor should uh, stop any other treatment that has been given in order to give our, our solutions. No, we are, we are coming on top of everything to just to uh, um, cover a, a gap that has been there and that has not been uh, treated, and it's natural. However, yes, afterwards we can discuss. I, don't, I would like to find out Yeah, because um, we can take more. any kind of molecule, informatize it, and transfer it digitally. So we can transfer any molecule, and even vitamin C or anything else, through the digital and then into the body. So I think we'll be very, you know, it, instrumental to what Instrumental, yes. I, I would, we, we can talk afterwards Thank about you very it. much. Thank nice. you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for our... i got a gentleman right here. All right. I like the front row guys. Hi. Cool. Yeah, sorry. Um, so my name's Sava Kudamalidis. I'm from Public Good Pharma. And just actually a question of what you raised around the US and the kind of collapsing healthcare system there. Basically, people can't afford new medicines and things like that. Uh, what are your thoughts about the opportunity for drug repurposing and like basically finding new low-cost ways of treating illnesses whereby those companies, particularly self-insured employers, like you're saying, um, like Amazon, Walmart, these are the biggest companies in the world, have these massive expenses due to, sure. due to medicines. What about partnering with you know, countries like single payers, like Greece, other you know, LMICs, about um, funding those kinds of studies for low-cost medicines, because that actually creates a, a business model, and particularly like digital therapeutics and things like that, where you can create one app and then like a million people get treated and it basically has no you know, marginal cost of supply. Yeah, so international pharmacy to me is something that should be adopted because we look at regulations around the world and there's this idea that most Americans have, and that is we're the best at everything. We're really darn good. But then you go to Sweden, you realize, well, life extension is just as high. In other parts of the world, the quality of life is incredible. Go here in Switzerland. So I think that we have a lot to learn, especially on, in the world of drugs uh, or remedies or to solutions. Uh, the system in the United States, unfortunately, rewards the companies through greed. And it's hard because they have a seat at the table. You know, there's a dear friend of ours. I think he picked up this saying from somebody else, and it said that you're either at the table or you're on the menu. 
And I think that there needs to be more conversation of people at the table, because when you're not there to have it, and you're right, the United States should have a great relationship uh, on international pharmacies uh, with Greece. Uh, in Canada, I know we've just begun uh, our neighbor, but there are incredible companies out there that are developing uh, medications to extend outcomes, uh, improve outcomes, extend lives. As a father and somebody who came from the world of uh, uh, risk management insurance, um, I love that question, by the way. And I don't want to use the word against them, and I don't want to call them. But don't forget, we need some protection for the guys that do the work. Because if you don't have that, nobody will try new drugs. There is this, I mentioned earlier before you came, about this lengthy processes, FDA approvals, all this money you spend on sometimes unnecessary. Now, a little bit more intelligence in that process would certainly help. But after 10 years, drugs are dropping by 90% the prices, sometimes even more, because others just take the ingredients and do it and, and give it to you for five, $5. I'm a diabetic, so you know how cheap now the treatments are. They're not always the best. Like if, if you take the obesity drugs that I take since two years, I lost 12 kilos. And I don't drink any alcohol anymore, which is the, the, bad, the sad part of it. But uh, if, you, if you take uh, your vials, your regular stuff, that costs you nothing. You go in there, you, you buy it, and the system covers it. And if, if uh, the system doesn't cover it, you pay five, five euros for six weeks uh, coverage. So there is a benefit to protecting the future with making money on that, but there's also a benefit when it runs out for um, many, many poor people. And I warn everyone, don't take this uh, uh, down and, and make it cheap immediately. Nobody will invest in this anymore. And if you're from Big Pharma, you know, Big Pharma plays the other game. They say, oh, we, we don't really do R&D work. We watch these little guys like we are, and if they are successful, we pay them a billion dollars, and we make 20 billion. That, that's, that's fine, because they say, we're a big company, we can't do this successfully, let the other guys do it, and in one out of 10 or two out of 10 make it with FDA approval, and then we go and pay. And I think, that's fine, right? That's good for the people that try trial and error. And the other one said, hey, we want to save new product, and we pay for it when we buy it. Pfizer. Well, it's only good if it's affordable. But, you know, as you say, like you can repurpose a generic drug, and the data is actually what's important. It's not the drug itself. Or like with diabetics, you could say have keto. Keto has been very effective uh, to reverse type 2 diabetes. But there's not a lot of money in funding trials. But if, you know, Walmart, Amazon, they could fund those trials, that would save money. I, I agree with you on that c completely. We have yeah, a, but that's another... not their business. Why should, I mean, no. uh, Walmart, yeah, Amazon, I'm not because sure. Because they're paying billions of dollars, and it's not sustainable. They're paying billions of dollars for what? For, for drugs, for new medicines, where they could pay a much lower cost treatment. But I, pay for well, the, I think I what I'm hearing you say is if we, had, yeah, if we had more research. I think they I disrupted yeah. the market already. I think prices have come down significantly through Amazon's in, uh, introduction into this market. I mean, there could be more. I'm fine for that. But if they take over the, the rest of it, it's going to be more expensive. <laughs> if they fund it, they own it. All right. Any other questions? We're down to two minutes. Uh, if not, we appreciate your time. Thank you for tuning in. I wish we had more time. This would be fun for a lively debate back and forth. Um, thank you again, everybody. I'll see you next time. Take care. Okay, thank you.